Welcome viewers. Uh, my name is Raja Narayana. I run Adiri Consulting. Uh, today, before I introduce my guest uh, to have this good conversation and discussion, I want to set the stage for what we're going to talk about in this webcast. If you're part of the technology industry, you know the challenges facing IT insiders can feel insurmountable. Clearly with pandemic, the acceleration for digital transformation has increased and thus the budget pressure equally has increased within companies and companies are struggling to uncover hard to find talent to help move their initiatives over the line faster their competitors than their competitors. So today I'm joined by Swati. She's our VP of, our VP of Consulting Services. Swati is an industry veteran uh, with over 15 years of experience. She's been with us for Swati, I'm guessing seven years. I hope Ten I years, got Roger. it right. Okay, awesome. So thanks for joining uh, me, Swati. You clearly uh, are working with a lot of our customers and prospects really closely day in and day out uh, for those who are facing these challenges. So welcome, walk us through. Um, it's a pleasure, Raja. Thank you for having me here, join you and speak to you about some of the challenges that the industry is witnessing today. Awesome. All right, so Swati, I'm gonna refer this survey that we did. Um, so don't mind me just looking at some of these accurate numbers we had um, as we dive into. So let's dive into this data. Uh, we clearly went out to 300 of our business leaders um, who are facing these challenges, who work with us closely and prospects and the likes. Clearly, uh, thanks to all of those uh, business leaders who responded, uh, some really valuable information. So there were five key areas that really uh, stood out to me uh, from our report. Those are clearly the cybersecurity is one, migration to the cloud is next, great resignation is another big one, which, which we also saw the last two years being the common trend, leveraging big data, and data-driven insights. And last but not least, the IT budget planning. So perhaps let's uh, kick off with the last one and it really ties to the rest of the stuff. So let's talk about IT budget planning first. Something I'm sure you are hearing on a daily basis. We know that the unpredictab unpredictability of the pandemic disrupted economy made it even more challenging than usual to plan for the future and determine budget allocation for the IT industry. Yet 83% of professionals we surveyed said they expected their IT budget to increase in the next 12 months with more spending year marked towards cloud and cybersecurity. Why do you think these two areas are in particular top of our clients' minds? Sure, Raja. I'm not surprised that a, report, that a report echoed and confirmed, to be honest, validated some of the key areas my team and I have been seeing spring up as conversations with IT leaders and partners. Let's think about it. The, the pandemic pushed organizations to explore work models that they had either never explored before or partially explore, explored before. And as they went into these work models, organizations had to quickly pivot their funds and reallocate them towards initiatives to keep their business moving forward, um, to gain competitive advantage, and in some scenarios, really just survive. So as they did that, what happened was a lot of IT gaps got identified, and I'm sure in the process, a lot of new gaps were created. Now, one thing is for sure, what we've learned is we've got to be better prepared as an industry. We've also learned that some things from the pandemic are here to stay, hybrid work. And if organizations have to operate and support that model, they're going to have to invest in digital initiatives. They're going to want to be more digital ready so they can support their own customers with the scale to, to help them scale fast, to reduce the overheads um, and the operational, um, the operational overheads really, and then to become more competitive. So that's, that's broadly the reasons why we're seeing our clients continue to push the digital um, urgency forward. As far as um, security is concerned, think about it. I think as an industry, we've all witnessed it. We've seen an increase in cybersecurity attacks and 
some sort of security breaches across the board. 55% of our own respondents in the report confirmed that their organizations had seen at least one major security breach in the last two years. Wow. We're, right. So we're, we're also seeing companies um, expand on their IT security teams. They're investing in those heavily to make sure that they're not, that this is no longer an afterthought, but they're really coming in with a security first mindset. So projects, as, uh, as they're being kicked off, are keeping security at the forefront uh, and the initi initiation phases versus down the path as they would do oftentimes previously. So no surprises there, that these two will continue to be top of mind and perhaps take the lion's share of the budget this year and potentially even into next year. Very true. Uh, you know, every, every one out of the three people I met um, this past, uh, month or so, Swati, you're right. Uh, every company have either been the victim of cybersecurity uh, or they have come across uh, their company being vulnerable. So for sure, um, that's certainly a key key subject. So let's uh, focus on the migration to cloud, which is, which is the second big um, takeaway that came from the survey. So less than 50% of our survey respondents said, almost half to three fourths of their company's core applications are cloud-based. And while well over 60% of respondents said their organization's usage of cloud technology was very effective, and a little more than half of the same respondents said they were suffering from the shortage of the skills uh, that's based on cloud. So is this something you are seeing across, across the board with your prospects or customers as you speak? Well, most of our customers, it's fair to say, have a blended environment. They've, they've got some portion of their, their environments on-prem and some portions of their environments in the cloud. Now, customers have definitely shared with us that they have goals internally to increase the percentage of their applications in the cloud. And there's a sense of urgency to do that. Now, when they look back at their teams, they may or may not have the teams ready to support those initiatives. And so they certainly have a big need to bring in um, talent that's experienced, has done this kind of work before to help support and lift and shift these initiatives um, going forward. But not just in migration, I think as I look back and I was thinking over it, um, the last two years or more, any and all of our projects, I don't remember any of them not requiring cloud skills. Every single initiative of ours indicates that they do require cloud skills and that ties in really well to say this is going to be a continuous need, whether it's cloud in, in the development space, DevOps, data, um, cloud infrastructure support. So we're certainly seeing an increased um, demand of bringing these skills on board to supplement our teams, whether it's you know, in an augmented fashion or it's while we build out the project teams to take on these projects end to end. And is that because do you see the pandemic has accelerated that journey for customers moving their apps to cloud? Or is this a trend you have seen coming over the years? Well, it's certainly been a trend over the years, but I do feel the pandemic has accelerated the need for it. Um, if organizations want to support going back to the hybrid workforce itself, they need to ensure that majority of their work is in cloud. Otherwise, they are going to require their workforce to be in the office, support the on-prem applications. On-prem solutions are also not typically as scalable sometimes. If they want to scale faster, they, they want to be in cloud that can permit that. That also allows them to get a lot of the efficiency that they're looking for, looking for in terms of the operational overheads. So there, there are a variety of reasons that are pushing this. But I do see the, the, the pandemic having played a big role in um, sensitizing the urgency towards it. Awesome. Very good insight. So you talked a lot about skill shortage specific to cloud, but you know it really just paints a much larger picture for the overall talent shortage. You know, every company uh, that I speak to, uh, every leaders that I speak to across different industries, different verticals, if there is one common theme outside of, you know, your regular conversation specific to uh, their challenges, talent, right? Building tech teams and talent. So 71% said their biggest challenge 
in our survey uh, is their you know, great resignation, which is a concept we have heard in the last two years relative to sourcing talent or retaining talent or their current talent leaving. So and as a result, more companies are switching to this hybrid model, right? Utilizing a combination of offshore, near shore, uh, and onsite, uh, all of those customization combination of strategy thereof. How can companies utilize this model to bridge this gap and get ahead of this great resignation to perhaps flip this to the advantage of great acceleration, if you will? Right. Um, I certainly think that this is the hottest topic that um, has been in front of or has been a part of the conversations that we've had pretty much all of this year. Uh, I'd say offshore has been around for a long time. And companies have utilized the model to gain scale efficiencies and, and to some effect gain competitive advantage too. We're definitely seeing a shift within organizations that were not as open to alternate work solutions previously. They're beginning to lean on these, explore these models and really exercise whether can they engage on some of this, beat this talent shortage currently and bridge the gaps that they're looking for. If we just look at the current local market, and I'm pivoting slightly here to, to share what the current state of affairs is, the BLS predicts the IT job market will increase and expand by 13% in this decade, so up until 2030. The current job market where it stands is there are 11 million job openings with 6.9 million unemployed Americans. So this is already a pretty big gap here. If you look at specifically within IT, the gap's just gonna go wider. So there's really no um, long-term solution as we can see just right, right, right here. Now couple that up with the great resignation wave and this makes for the perfect storm. Yep. So, you know, I, I don't think hiring is the only challenge, hiring, retention, career growth, just a lot more that companies are having to, to fold in to attract this talent and keep this talent going within their organizations. There are talent rich markets that are in other areas. We've seen near shore spring up quite a bit. So Latin America is a, is a popular choice. I've heard Canada is a popular choice as well. We've heard Philippines come up quite a lot as well in conversations. I've also heard um, cities out of Africa that are coming up as, uh, as locations that companies are exploring too. Um, to leverage the talent out of these um, out of these spots. But now, why have these areas not come up before, Swati? I'm curious because these areas did exist pre-pandemic. So why has these areas come up? Do you see do you see a reason why some of these areas are now quite front and center in 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 finding talent and putting a team together? So let's talk just specific to Latin America. Um, it does provide a lot of efficiency to, or a lot of advantages, not efficiency, but advantages. There's um, time zone advantages. So folks can work a lot more in close um, lockstep with teams that are based near shore. There's obviously cost efficiencies, so they can still gain. There is um, cultural and communication um, similarities mm -hmm. that, that can be utilized. Um, if you just look at their, their, the universities that are out there, the kind of talent that they're, the kind of graduates they're pushing out, there's a lot of engineering talent that's coming out of those markets. There is a lot of young generation that is ready to get into the workforce over there. These are all elements that make that location very suitable. Um, I do think that there was a heavy reliance on offshore. One of the aspects of the pandemic may have um, created or brought out to light is organizations that were heavily reliant on just offshore models are pivoting because they've experienced different challenges in that space. They've had to pivot to really look at, we, we don't want to uproot our offshore, but we want to hedge our bets a little bit here and also have near shore presence. So we're not putting all our eggs in one basket, if you will, and, um, and keeping business, uh, keeping the lights on when such times occur. So I do see for those reasons, these markets are springing up more and more. Um, if I just talk about offshore, we all know, you know, popular location is India and some other, some other countries and they are saturated. For example. Right. 
and, and they're competitive. They're still very competitive. The market trends are, are different. Yes, they offer a lot of price efficiencies, but it does come at a cost to business as well. So I do think companies are being forced to look at alternative options, and that's generating the interest in the other alternate locations. And you're right, with inflation um, in certain countries going out of the roof, some of these offshore locations are perhaps with increased wage pressure. Uh, I'm only guessing that uh, the, the delta difference to nearshore wouldn't be much, right? And if you can um, broaden the talent with uh, nearshore for those, um, they'll, they'll be a great one. So what are some of the hot areas to find tech talent do you see? So if I speak generically, um, I've seen Pittsburgh. It's um, it's a tech hub specifically for autonomous technology as well as robotics. It's coming up quite a bit. Um, Atlanta is coming up quite a bit. I've heard of Chicago and Tampa springing up in a lot of conversations. So onshore, I think those are you know four or five of the top locations that we're seeing. Um, other locations geographically, I've mentioned them before, I've seen uh, out of Latin America, Mexico City, popular choice, Brazil, another popular choice. Um, out of Africa, it's been Kenya and Nigeria. I don't mind That's, going if you have an office there for sure. Me too, Raja. Take me <laughs> along. <laughs> um, and then Philippines. Philippines is a very interesting prospect that's come up as well. Um, and now I'm going to be a little biased here towards Didi. We've done a, a, a pretty good job at continuously exploring new delivery centers and new locations to bring this talent in and allow our clients to utilize and explore and try out um, these talent pools through the project teams that they're building. Our main delivery center is in India. Um, and we've also got about three or four years ago, we expanded into Hungary out of Eastern Europe. But off late the last few months, we've worked tremendously hard to build out uh, our presence in Latin America, Mexico City, and Colombia are the two locations that we've gone with. And we're quickly exploring Philippines as, as one of the prospects amongst other locations. I do feel there's a lot of promise, and I'm optimistic about the opportunity that this presents for the clients and for the partners that, that we're going to support. Interesting. So as we look at talent, clearly not one size fits all. Um, uh, you know, with with all the uh, all the diversity movement and inclusion movement, it has certainly helped um, talent that are underserved and overlooked. Right. It's very interesting to look at our own survey response related to diversity. So diversity and inclusion is a big topic. Organizations said the efforts to improve their diversity and inclusion in the tech side are working, but really not yet there. Um, you know, if I look at some of the respondents that said really only 31% of our respondents said less than 30% to almost probably 40% of their teams are female. So really, one, first, it's very challenging to get women in engineering or technology, if you will. And then even further, an engineering leader, being a woman, is another uh, uh, big push that organizations are trying to you know, include and, and promote. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts. What are you seeing uh, on the ground? So first off, Raja, this is a near and dear topic to my heart. Um, as, I, as I look back into it, believe it or not, one of my key electives in my master's was actually diversity. Not knowing the true impact of it and not knowing the, the gravity of the topic, I took How it on I and I enjoyed after it. After being here for seven years, how did I miss that? Ten years, Raja. Yeah, but, ten years. Right. But, You're going to keep yeah. debating about this. Yeah, you, there's lots more. There's lots more <laughs> to me uh, than you know, I guess. that's We need to talk more, I guess, then. Right. Um, but as, I, as I've as I look back the last 12 years of working in Pacific Northwest, I've certainly seen a lot of our clients make the push towards DNI initiatives. And to that effect, the results are visible. We've seen a lot more diverse talent, women in, in tech roles across these customers, predominantly in individual contributor roles. Is the where I notice that the gap is when we go up the chain a little bit and start looking at the managerial um, levels in these organizations. There's definitely a gap in, in comparison to the other um, representations. Um, and as we 
go further up the chain to senior leadership, um, of course, it's blaringly low, and that's not that's not anything new that I'm sharing. It's 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 there, and it's a, it's a continuous um, investment that companies are making. In my experience with the customers that we've worked with, the ones who've made a concerted effort towards increasing their numbers have seen the value out of it. Now, what I mean by that is they're not only looking at bringing diverse talent as their full-time employees, but they're also utilizing an opportunity to bring diversity through their vendors that they may bring on through augmentation programs or through the vendor partners they're working uh, across on projects. What this really allows them to do is bring the diverse ideas, thought process that they require in to evolve their own products. So I, I think that they've been able to cash upon it. And what this has done for them is it's really created a competitive advantage because now they're beginning to attract more diverse talent and they're able to retain more of that talent for longer durations because they, they see the value and they're able to build camaraderie within these teams. And, and this, is, uh, this is a topic that a lot of young talent feels very close to and they find themselves picking employers that represent and provide those representations for them. Um, I would say that I've had an opportunity to partner with some phenomenal women leaders who are committed and involved in a variety of different groups to encourage women and girls from different fields to choose tech. Um, there's still a long way to go, but um, each one has a little fair share to play in it. And as I look back at Aditi itself, we've done a lot of work within our engineering team to build the representation, have more diverse talent and specifically women. You also have engineering background, if I'm not wrong, correct? I do, I do. Okay, I, um, that's a different story for another time. Sure. Um, but that's where I started my career from. Um, and as I, as I look back, we've done, we've done a lot of work in increasing that representation. But like several of our customers, we too are challenged in the leadership roles and having women in engineering leadership roles. And I think that's a journey that we're also going to take on. And I look forward to helping us get there. Awesome, Swati. I'm sure we can you know, keep, keep talking. These, these are topics that are passionate to both of us. Uh, and, I, and I certainly have learned quite a lot uh, from today. It's been great uh, speaking with you. And I hope um, that you have provided as much insights for us and the viewers. Uh, I think so many will benefit from this, this perspective, as I know I have and many at Alti have. Uh, thank you for being part of my quick, good discussion. Uh, if folks want to tune in today, who are tuning in today, if you want more details for any of these uh, insights, please refer to our report on our website. But uh, okay. Swati, how can, um, how can folks here, viewers here, if they want to reach out and get to know and learn more from you, uh, what, what can they do? Sure. First off, thank you, Raja, for inviting me for this conversation. It's been great speaking with you and discussing the topics that are um, that are the work and the world that I breathe day in and day out and some of the topics that I'm passionate about. Um, I'm very active on LinkedIn, so anyone and any of the viewers who would like to reach out for a discussion um, or to ideate, I'm, I welcome you reaching out to me on LinkedIn. It also houses my contact details and my email address, so feel free to reach out to me via that as well. Thank you. That's Swati Batnagar, our VP of Client Services, Consulting Services. Swati, thank you so much for your time. And I'm ending here. Raja, again, thank you all so much. Thank you.